Brother Wadley has a lot of tenacity. I think he has a, a somewhat of an indomitable spirit. Maybe his wife would know that's not always the case, but to others it sure seems like it. I mean, the guy is a pioneering spirit and it seems hard to get the guy down. He's always determined that the next day is going to be the greatest day and the things to come are going to be the greatest things. And I'm glad God brought him here to Canada. And so pray for him and the Near North Baptist Church and the work they're trying to establish in Sudbury and uh, church in Kapiskasi that he kind of has the care for that they'd like to see revived and restarted and a man to go there as well and just pray for him. God is using him here in Canada and we're glad that God brought him. You come and preach the word of God to us. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Brother Johnston has become a good friend of mine. We meet, we, we started meeting during COVID uh, on Zoom to have a, a Baptist Friends prayer meeting. And so we meet every week that way on Tuesdays to pray at 11 a.m. And so, but I'm really thankful for the opportunity. We brought some young men uh, from our church and we're glad to be here. This is our first time at the Men of the Word breakfast. How many of you, it's your first time to this breakfast today? Okay, quite a few. That's good. Well, hopefully we'll be able to come back again. Amen. That's great. And the meal was great and really enjoyed that. If you take God's Word with me, and go with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to take a passage today and we're going to make an application to the new year and to men of the Word. Perhaps you've come today, maybe you were invited by a pastor or you you were invited by a friend, and perhaps you would not call yourself a Christian today. You would say, well, I'm kind of looking into Christianity. I really don't know. I couldn't say I know for sure if I was to die that I would go to heaven. This message is for you. And perhaps you're a pastor or a helper to your pastor. By the way, you're even either doing one of two things. You're either pastoring a church or you're helping somebody pastor a church. And maybe you're a helper to the pastor. I want to encourage you to move forward today as a man that God has called to follow Him. Luke 9 and verse 57 just a short passage of Scripture, the Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Amen. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go, bid them farewell, which are at my home and my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I want you to mark a, a phrase there. And we're really going to take this because we know this applies to women as well, being a disciple of the Lord. This is anybody who's following the Lord. But just because we're all men here today, let's take it personal. No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, in the new year, pastors love the new year, at least I do. I get very stressed out during Christmas time, but I like this Sunday coming up because I get to tell our church what I've been praying about is the new vision or the new plan, new verse, a new theme we're going to be preaching on for the new year. And I really enjoy that. And perhaps your pastor is going to challenge you this year to read the Bible more. I guarantee you today if I ask how many of you men, how many of all of us need to read the Bible more, all of us would agree. We'd raise our hand and say, you know, I wish I could read the Bible more. I think I should make that a goal in 2024. I, would, I wouldn't doubt that everybody would almost raise your hand. If I said, how many of you men uh, realize that you need to pray more than you did in 2023? I would think all of us would have both hands raised because the most convicting thing that we need is prayer. We need this in our lives. We would, we would think right. prayer is the thing that we need. And really that's the missing element in many ways in the Christian life. I'm not trying to belittle prayer. Maybe we could say this, maybe we need to be a better soul winner. Some of us really struggle with the idea of boldness. I know men in our church do. They struggle. They say, Pastor, that's good for you. You must have some kind of gift. You can go out on the street and talk to people. But I really kind of struggle with opening up a conversation or even knowing what to say or I've just been saved. 
And you say, well, in 2024, I like to witness to more people. And we all should do all of those things. That's a wonderful thing. Every one of those things are biblical and every one of those things are needed. Perhaps we could say this. I need to depend and trust God more. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And that's what the Bible says that we should do. But I want to tell you, you can read all of the Bible ten times in 2024. But if you don't obey the Bible, it won't make any difference in your life. You can pray hours on end. You can pray, if it were possible, 24 hours a day. And still, it would make no impact. Not because God doesn't want to make an impact on your life. Because you can know the things that you ought to do but if you aren't obedient to what God has said in his written revelation it will make no impact on your life personally. You can pray all you want to but if you do not have this missing element that's missing so much in my life that I'm convicted about. You can read all the Bible. You can pray all you want to. You can witness to people. You know I know many people who will witness and talk to many people and will hand out tracts and that's a wonderful thing to do that but yet their life is so far away from the Bible. I don't know if you've ever met people like that. You know, one, there's one guy I met that was like that. That was me. I, it's really easy after you're trained to hand out a track. It's a whole lot harder to live what the Bible says. We need to do both, right? And perhaps we can say Christian things like we need to trust God more. But really, trusting God makes no difference if we're not willing to obey God. If we're not willing to do what He says that we ought to do. And this has to do with our attitude. And so many times as men, our attitude is not what it ought to be. Now, I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience of my walk with the Lord. Notice what the verse says in verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, this is a would-be disciple. He says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean some man. It says no man. He says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Did you know there's never been an exception to this rule? God says, no man. There's not one man in this room who looked back from serving Jesus Christ and did not keep their hands to the plow that kept going for Christ. God says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If we want to look at it this way, let's, let's bring it into 2024 and let's just all understand what this word apathy means. I think we can all understand apathy. Apathy is saying, I don't know and I don't care. How many Christian men do you know of right now on the top of your head that would say, I don't know and I don't care? I, I know what the Bible says, but I, I, I'm not too interested in obeying it. I know that's what I should do. I know that's what my pastor says I ought to do, but I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to actually surrender my will to God's will. I'm not living out in sin. I'm not pursuing evil. My family's in church, but there is so much more God has for you than just Sunday morning, just Sunday night and Wednesday night, and I'm for all three. God God wants a solely consecrated, dedicated Christian. And God says here, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. There was a man who was in England. He was a pastor of a church back in the 1800s. Now you got to remember in the 1800s that was the Victorian era. There was a lot of money in England at that time. They ruled the world. And so you had the great British Empire going and you had lots of religion there. And so this man was a pastor. He was very comfortable in his setting. And as he's in this church, uh, before he was saved, he got saved underneath this verse. His name was James Hannington. And James Hannington heard a message, a gospel message, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And he thought, I can't go forward because I'm not saved. But I don't want to look back because I don't want to go to hell. That's what he thought. And so he was converted. He was saved because of this verse, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for for the kingdom of God. But later on he became a minister. When he was a minister in this church in England, he lived in a nice little village, had a beautiful family. Everything was going wonderful and comfortably. 
But that verse came to his heart again. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He had heard of, a, of two martyrs in the, in the area, in the continent of Africa. These men had went over from Great Britain and they were murdered over there in that country. And he became very burdened that Africa needed to be reached for the gospel. He was in conflict in, in, within himself and his own spiritual life. And he began to think, well, what should I do? I know I'm pastoring a church here. But so he went for a time to Africa. He went on a mission trip, as we would call it. And he went to Africa to help establish some churches. And when he got there, uh, he got saved sickness after sickness after sickness after fever and he almost died. They thought he would die. Now he made some good connections with chiefs and things like that there but he almost died and he had to go back to England because of his health and on the boat ride on the way back home many back home would have been glad he came home. Many would have said why don't you just settle down? Why don't you just calm down? Why don't you just be content to be comfortable? But James Hannington on the boat ride back from Africa Africa to England, the verse again came to his mind, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And he said, I'm going back to Africa when I get better. He went back to Africa. When he went to Africa, he came and, and the politics had changed within the tribes. They took the man and they, they killed him for the cause of Christ. And so they took him. They didn't want to hear the gospel at this time. And as he landed, when they took him as a prisoner, he began to laugh because of his horrible fate. He didn't know anything else to do but laugh. And as they were taking him to kill him, he sang the hymn, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. We don't find too many men like that today, do we? We don't find too many men who would say, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Fishing is too important for us. Hunting is too important for us. Cars are too important for us. Golf and sports are too important for us. Working is too important for us. Going on vacation once a year is too important for us. But God doesn't say all of those things are necessary. In fact, God says one thing is necessary if we're going to read the Bible, if we're going to pray, if we're going to sow in, if we're going to be the proper father and the proper husbands that we ought to be, there is a rock solid determination that we need to say, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. How is your determination? How is your determination? Can you say I'm that man? Amen. There have been many days that I haven't been that man. And I know many of us get discouraged, don't we? We need encouragement. I, I want you to, if you take notes, you might want to write these things down. The first one is the excuses for not plowing for Jesus. Notice what he says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back. God describes a Christian life as plowing. Now that's hard work. Most people want to, you know, have a nice vacation fund or our, our uh, health and wealth people, they want a helicopter fund or whatever you want. But here he says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back. In those days when they had a plow, uh, they had an ox, they plowed with oxen, and they stood on the instrument, they were the plow, and they pushed their weight down into the ground. And as they pushed their weight down into the ground, the further they drove their feet down in and pushed their weight as hard as they could down into the ground, that meant that they could start off well. If they did not push their weight down strongly, what would happen is the ox, because it was so strong, would pull them out of the ground and the, the lines that they, the plow, the rows that they would plow would be uneven. Another thing they did was they would look ahead and they would see there was a marker ahead of them. And people who plow today will find out they'll put a little red flag at the end of the field. And all the lines are marked because they had to keep their eyes on that red flag. Now if they started looking over here at some little animal running over the side, the plow would just go this way. If they started getting distracted by something that was happening in the bush over here, uh, they, they would go this way. But they had to keep their eyes on one thing, that little red flag at the end. 
And that's what Jesus said about the Christian life. It is plowing. It is blood, sweat, toil, and tears. And he says, keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't look to the right hand. Don't look to the left hand. Keep on plowing. Amen. And he says here, there's excuses. Well, look, look at verse 57. The Bible says, And it came to pass as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Some of you pastors can understand. That's like some of your church members, right? They say it like this. He comes to a service. Let's, let's put it in a modern day context. This guy comes to a service. He says, I'm a follower of Jesus. And he says to the Lord Jesus, I will follow thee. That's like somebody who responds at an invitation. And they say, Lord, I want to be a preacher. Lord, I want to be a faithful father. Lord, I want to be a good carpenter and a good witness in the workplace, whatever it might be. You surrender that and you come to the Lord and you make the Lord promises. Did you know there are lots of men who make promises and don't keep them? And here, here's the first excuse. He says here, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. He says, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. And Jesus said unto him, wait a minute, before you start making promises you can't keep... Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He says, you want to follow me? You said you want to go with me anywhere? It sounds good to go with Jesus on an evangelistic preaching tour, but it sounds a whole lot different when you don't have a place to sleep at night. And he says, you know, foxes even have a place to sleep, but not Jesus. Birds, they have nests up in the air in the trees, but not Jesus. The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. You won't even know. You won't even have a promise of where to lay your head. Did you know there's a man named Hudson Taylor? I love reading about Hudson Taylor. He's my favorite missionary to study after. Hudson Taylor, he went to China, and he was so burdened because they had financial difficulties in the mission board that he was with. And while they were there, he became burdened that a Christian shouldn't go in debt. <clears throat> and he began to say, one day we're going to live by faith. We're not going to do this where we are constantly in debt as a mission board. So, what happened is he went home for a furlough time. He was in Brighton Beach, down in the southern part of England. He couldn't stand it. He began to look around at all the rich people with the, uh, the ladies with their beautiful dresses and hats on and men with their lovely suits on. He said, I couldn't stand it. I ran down the hill, and if you've been to Brighton, it's a really tall hill. He ran down from a church down onto the beach, and he said, I will surrender to go to inland China. You see, inland China was dangerous. Inland China was a deadly place to be. No man would venture into inland China. And so Hudson Taylor said, I'll go. He, he began to travel different places. He traveled different places in North America. And he had one message. He, he didn't get up and he, he didn't say, you know, if you come to the mission field, here's what's going to happen. All these wonderful things will happen. Here was his message. Pack your things in a casket. You'll never be coming home. And that wasn't a very popular message as it seemed. There's no pay for that. You don't get helicopter funds there. And there was one little boy, one young man who came with his stuff packed in a casket to leave the next day. He came to Canada at the Niagara Bible Conference and he spoke. And there was a young man who surrendered and he stayed in Canada to help organize for Hudson Taylor. But I believe they're in North America when they started the North American branch of the China Inland Mission. There were about 14 young people and adults who went out to plant churches. And they said, we'll go inland China. And notice what the Bible says here. He says, pack your things in a casket. But then he says in verse 58, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. In other words, there's the excuse of comfort. Did you know many of us give this idea, Lord, I will follow you. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. But as soon as the Holy Spirit convicts you that you should lay some amount of comfort aside, you say, no, I won't go that far. That's an excuse. Here's another one. Notice verse 58. Or verse 59. But he said, and he said unto another. Now, this guy did not come to Jesus. Jesus came to this man. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. So this man, Jesus comes to and he convicts. This may be somebody here today. 
you're sitting during this preaching. You know what God has wanted you to do. He's convicted you to do this for a long time, to be a laborer for Him, to plow with the gospel, to help your pastor in your local church, wherever you are, or to go abroad, or to plant churches in Canada. And the Lord is working on your heart. You know you ought to do it. You're under conviction. And then the Bible says here, but He said... You see, God is calling. Are you willing to be a laborer for Him? There's so many people God is calling. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Now, I know pastors are praying over and over and over, and all of us need help in our churches. And we're praying over and over and over that God would send help. Now, why aren't they coming? Have you ever asked that question? I, didn't, I read that verse, pray you therefore the Lord of harvest that He will send, and I think, Lord, where are they? It almost seems discouraging. Where are they? I'll tell you where they are. They're at this point. But He said, He said, Lord, suffer me first. You know what we have? We have a lot of men who say me first instead of Lord. You can't say Lord and me first in the same sentence. And these men are saying, Lord, I know you've convicted me, but yet me first. I, I have to go bury my father. Did you know the Bible doesn't even say his father was dead? That could have been that his father was dead and he had a funeral. But notice what Jesus says in verse 60. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. He's saying this, Let the dead in sin bury the dead. In other words, lost people can have funeral services just like saved people have funeral services. He said, You let those in the secular world take care of those, that are sec those things that are secular, but you do the things that I've called you to do. Christians live on a different level. And he says here, Follow me. He says, says, Suffer me first that I may go bury my father. In other words, he wanted to do what he wanted to do before God's will in his life. What about you? There's comfort and then there's convenience. It's easier for him to say, let me go bury my father. Are you willing to do anything? Are you willing to go? Are you willing to say, I will go now? I will do what God wants me to do now. No strings attached. If there's no money, if there's no promise of a future, if there's no promise of growth of a church that I planted, will you be willing to go anyway or will you say, me first? He says there's excuses. Now here's the next thing. There's in, there is uh, engagement. Notice verse 61 and 62. And another said, here's another excuse. Lord, I will follow thee, but let me go bid them farewell which are at my home and my house. This is probably the biggest one. Probably. They're all three big. But notice the first one, that's comfort. The second one, that's convenience. But we see here... We have calling. You know what's calling here? God is calling. We know God's calling. But family's calling as well. And he says, let me bid them farewell which are at my home and my house. Was he saying you couldn't say goodbye to your family? No, he's not saying you can't say goodbye to your family. There's nothing wrong with that. But he's saying here, if your goal is to say, Lord, let me first go bid them farewell. You see, it's about me first, Lord, and, and I want to, my family is more important than you. My home is more important than you. My house is more important than you. I want to do what I want to do. In other words, the things I own, the things I do, and the people I love keep me from serving Jesus Christ. And the people at my home, Lord, I want to go one day. I will go one day. I will serve you one day. I will serve you in the future one day. But let me first. I need to go over here and handle some things and get some things in order. Did you know I went to Bible college with people who are well-meaning, sincere people. They went through Bible college and even graduated. And here's what they said. You know, one day when I graduate from Bible college, in about five or ten years, I'm going to go to school. Maybe I'll get a master's degree and a doctorate degree and I'm going to do all of these things and then I got this plan. I've got a 10 year plan and what I'm going to do is I'm going to work and then I'm going to save up money and then after I save up money then I'm going to get things in order and then maybe after I buy a home I'll sell it and make money off it and then maybe I can go to the mission field one day. Those people never went. You know why? Because they didn't believe no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
And we see here, family keeps me from serving Jesus. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you don't hate your father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in your own life also, you cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not take up his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. We have to love Jesus more than any other person. We have to love Jesus more than any other comfort. And we have to love Jesus more than any other thing in this world. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. There's the excuses. There's the encouragement. What's the encouragement? Jesus said the encouragement is at the end of verse 60. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. You're worried about all of these three excuses panning out. Quit giving excuses and just go. Quit giving excuses and go thou and preach the kingdom of God. If you look at all the different statistics. If you just look at the numbers. Think of the people in the greater Toronto area. If we could take the greater Toronto area. We have like around 2.7, I would think, somewhere around in that area, 2.3. But then you have in the larger area, GTA, there's probably close to 5.1 million. And you're thinking, well, we have a few good independent Baptist churches, and that's wonderful. We're thankful for them. There needs to be more in a city of 5 million people. You take Ottawa with about 1.3 million people in there, and Gatineau, Quebec, and you think, what could be done there? You think Montreal, we have good churches that are represented there. But there's a city there that used to be the largest city in Canada until 1997. What could be done there? And you think of little towns like Capus Casing with 8,500 people. And Canada's loaded with those kind of towns. Amen. Well, who's going to go there? Yeah. You know what the will of God is for you? The will of God is not a location. The will of God is God. Right. And if we follow God, God may lead us to a place of 8,500 or 8.5 million. But we'll be following God if we're willing to leave all behind and follow Him. There's the encouragement. Go thou and preach. It doesn't say you have to preach well. <laughs> Man, when I first started preaching in our church, I never pastored a church. I went about 15, 20 minutes. And I, I guess you're wishing I'd have done that today. <laughs> and, and I thought, man, that was a horrible sermon. But people said, Pastor, that was a good sermon. I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> That's horrible. But you think, it doesn't mean that you have to preach talented. It just means you have to go. Did you see, talent is so overrated. There's so many people who, who look glitzy and glamorous and they can sing and they can preach and they can do all of those things outwardly. But they're not willing to follow the Lord. Are you willing just to go? Whether you have the talent or not, you say, I can't speak. Moses couldn't speak. You say, I have a rough past. Paul had a rough past. He planted more churches than anybody in the New Testament. God can use you with all your faults and all your failures and all your disabilities. Disabilities becomes God's ability. There's the encouragement. Here's the last thing. Or the engagement. We see the encouragement here. Notice the encouragement. He says here, And Jesus said unto him in verse 62, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now what's going to happen if you start looking back? If you're plowing and you're standing on that plow and you're pushing that plow into the ground and you start looking back behind you and thinking about all of those things you used to do and all of those things that are behind you and you start focusing on those things instead of looking ahead of you at that little red marker, what's going to happen? That huge ox is just going to pull you right off. You're going to end up on the ground. And you know we have people who years ago said, I will follow Jesus. But they're somewhere laying on the ground somewhere. Because they got their eyes off Jesus and started looking behind them somewhere. And God says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the encouragement. All you have to do is press into the plow, hold on to the plow, keep your eyes on Jesus and leave the rest to Him. And He'll take care of the rest. It's no more complicated than that. Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. Isaiah 50 and verse 7. Jesus says this, and the Bible says this of the prophecy of Jesus. It says, Therefore have I set my face as a flint. 
Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 57 and 58. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And the Bible says we should move forward. And I'm thinking of old James Hannington. I never met him. When I get to heaven, I like to meet him and talk to him. And James Hannington, that man who left all the comforts and conveniences behind. Do you think today that if we ask James Hannington up there in heaven, do you think it was a, a bad thing that you went to Africa? I don't think he'd say that at all. I think he'd say, I wish I'd have given more to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the question is not, did James Hannington give all? The question is, will you give all? Some of you are under conviction. Some of you know you need to be saved. I want to tell you the one who gave all. Jesus Christ left the comforts and conveniences of heaven. He left the glories and the perfection of heaven. He became a man without ceasing to be God, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men so that you could be saved. He died on Calvary's cross. And if you will turn to Him and repent and believe the gospel, you will be saved today. And perhaps you're under conviction. You say, I'm a Christian man. But I haven't been following the Lord as I ought. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We are thankful that we can be men of the Word. We pray that You would be glorified alone. That we would not see a personality, we would see Christ. We pray that You would do a work today that is only explained by God. We pray for the salvation of souls and we pray for the calling of laborers. In Jesus' name, Amen.